In this video review, I'm going to do um, topic 21, which was protein transport. Um, and I'm not going to cover the whole topic. I'm only going to cover a little bit of it, but I'm going to do nuclear import and protein import into the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so we can begin. So remember that all proteins, or the majority of proteins, are made in the cytoplasm over here. Okay, remember the uh, messenger RNA is made from the nucleus, it's exported, and that's where protein synthesis is, is contained. However, most proteins, or a, a lot of proteins, have their functions in different organelles. For example, a protein can have a function in the nucleus, in the chloroplast, if this is a plant cell, and the mitochondria, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, and so on. So there needs to be a, a way to get protein into these organelles that's originally synthesized in the cytoplasm. And that's what we're going to talk about today. There are three main ways. The first is to transport a protein into the nucleus. And this can be done through transport of in, through what are called nuclear pores. And I'll talk about that in a second. Another issue is proteins need to be transported into organelles across different membranes, such as the mitochondria and the chloroplast. So some, some proteins can be actually transported physically through these membranes. And a third way that proteins can get into these different organelles is by transport uh, through vesicles. So if a protein is originally made in the ER right here, this protein can then, then be transported via a vesicle to the Golgi apparatus, and ultimately this vesicle can be transported to the plasma membrane if it needs to be. Okay, so those are the three main mechanisms to transport proteins. So all proteins who are destined for anywhere other than, this, than the cytoplasm contain what is called a signal sequence. And this is actually a sequence of amino acids on the protein itself, on the polypeptide, that targets a protein to a certain part of the cell or a certain organelle. So you can see some examples here. You can see an ER signal sequence, and you can see a mitochondria signal sequence, and a nucleus signal sequence. And they're all a variety of different um, uh, arrangements of amino acids. They're typically 15 to 60 amino acids long, so they're not very long, they're pretty short. And typically what happens is once the signal sequence has targeted that protein to an organelle, they're removed from the protein uh, as a whole, and the protein can go on and do its function. All right, so we're gonna see how these signal sequences actually uh, can target these proteins to the nucleus and to the ER. So one thing to remember about signal sequences is that they are what we call necessary and sufficient. Okay, you'll hear this word in science a lot, necessary and sufficient. And this can simply be explained by showing this experiment. Let's say I have a protein here, let's call it protein A. And, and this protein belongs in the cytoplasm. And in the endoplasmic reticulum, I have another protein, protein B. Well, because this protein is destined for the ER, it has right here an ER signal sequence. Okay, But if I take protein A, and I move this ER signal sequence onto the end of protein A, I take it away from protein B, what you'll find is that when those proteins are made in the cytoplasm, protein B now remains in the cytoplasm because it's lacking this signal sequence. It's basically not there anymore. And protein A now is in the endoplasmic reticulum because now it has this signal sequence. So the signal sequence is necessary to target a protein to an organelle but it's also sufficient. It's all that, that needs to be there to uh, make the protein go into that organelle. So that's what necessary and sufficient is, and that shows you the importance of these signal sequences. So a very simple experiment, but can, can really show uh, a good, good result and conclusion. So we're gonna do two things. We're gonna talk about nuclear import, and then we're gonna do um, endoplasmic reticulum import. So for nuclear import, Proteins that are destined for the nucleus contain a nuclear localization signal, or what's called an NLS, and this is the signal sequence for targeting a protein to the nucleus. It's typically a very short stretch of positively charged amino acids here. You can see lysines and arginine. And it's typically on the N-terminus of the protein, um, somewhere around the N-terminus, but it doesn't have to be. And so what this nuclear localization signal does is it targets the protein transport through what is called the nuclear pore complex. And you can see this complex right here. Okay, this is the nuclear pore complex. It's a multi-protein assembly 
that essentially takes uh, uh, the, the nuclear envelope and makes uh, pores in it, little holes, uh, that proteins can move through. So let's look a little bit more closely at the nuclear envelope. And remember, it's a double membrane, so it's two lipid bilayers. And the outer lipid bilayer actually is what we call contiguous with, or continuous, I'm sorry, with the endoplasmic reticulum. That means that the outer membrane starts forming the plasma membrane of the ER as well. And there's little perforations in the nuclear uh, envelope that are formed by this nuclear pore complex, which is a complex of proteins that makes uh, essentially holes that proteins and material can transport between the cytosol and the nucleus. So let's look at the pathway for nuclear transport. The first thing you need is a cargo protein, and we just call this a cargo protein because it means it's any protein that's destined for the nucleus. And the key to having a protein destined for the nucleus is a cargo protein has to contain a nuclear localization signal. And remember, this is a very small stretch of positively charged amino acids. Well, what this does is the nuclear localization signal specifically binds to another protein called the nuclear transport receptor. And this receptor will bind to the, act, to the NLS signal itself and therefore make a complex with the cargo protein. This complex will then move into the nucleus, okay, and so now you've delivered your cargo protein to the inside of the nucleus just like you want it to do, but the problem is that this cargo protein can't do its function because it's, it's bound to the nuclear transport receptor. So to fix that, there's another protein called RAN-GTP, over here, RAN-GTP, and this is a GTP binding protein, which means a few things. One, it's active when bound to GTP. Two, it has its own GTPase activity, so it can hydrolyze GTP into GDP, and that will inactivate the protein. So RAN's function is to actually bind to the NLS receptor up here and release the cargo protein to the nucleus. So when RAN and GTP is, is active, when RAN is bound to GTP and therefore active, it'll bind to the nuclear transport receptor over here, and that will change the conformation of this receptor and that's what releases the cargo protein into the nucleus, and this cargo protein can now do its function inside the nucleus. And so what happens with this complex now is the RAN, GTP, and the nuclear transport receptor move back out of the nucleus through the nuclear pore complex back into the cytoplasm. When it's in the cytoplasm, RAN hydrolyzes GTP okay, and forms RAN-GDP. So remember, RAN-GDP is inactive. So therefore, because the protein is inactive, it can no longer bind to this transport receptor, and so this complex disassembles. And so what you have here is now you have free RAN-GDP that can now move back into the nucleus and reactivate, and now you have also free nuclear transport receptor over here that can now bind to more cargo protein and transport it into the nucleus. So this is a constant cycle going over and over again with the nuclear transport receptor and RAN GTP cycling between the inside of the nucleus and the outside of the nucleus to bring in cargo protein every time it cycles. Okay, so that's essentially the, the four-step mechanism of how a protein that contains a nuclear localization signal gets imported into the nucleus. And so one thing I would like for you to think about for terms of exam is Let's imagine that we had a RAN GTP here that lost the ability to hydrolyze GTP. Let's say it was mutated and RAN GTP can no longer hydrolyze GTP to GDP. What do you think would happen to, to, that, to this cycle over time? Okay, so that's nuclear import. And lastly, we're going to do uh, endoplasmic reticulum import. It's a very similar mechanism in terms of the sequence uh, signal sequences that the protein needs to have, but it's a little bit different in how it gets into the endoplasmic reticulum because there are no pores in the ER, so things have to be transported across the membrane. So first, let's talk about what the ER signal sequence is. The ER signal sequence is essentially a stretch of eight or more hydrophobic amino acids, typically on the very end terminus of the protein. So you can see here as an example of one, you essentially have uh, six amino acids 
on the N-terminus and then the, the ER signal sequence. So it's very close to the N-terminus, and you'll see why that is in a second. But it's a stretch of hydrophobic amino acids, and that's all you need to signal a protein into the endoplasmic reticulum. So here's the mechanism of how ER import occurs. What happens is as an M mRNA is being translated by a ribosome in the cytoplasm, the ER signal sequence is one of the first things that's made. Okay, the, the polypeptide, the very first end of the polypeptide contains the ER signal sequence because remember it's right on the N-terminus. And that's for a reason, because the second this ER signal sequence is exposed from the ribosome, a protein called a signal recognition particle will bind to both the ribosome and the ER signal sequence and actually stop translation. Okay, so this whole complex up here is now stopped. And it sits here as a, a co complex of mRNA, ribosome, um, a growing polypeptide chain, and the signal recognition particle. So it stops because what happens is now this whole complex moves towards the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum and binds to another protein called the SRP receptor. So this is a receptor for the signal recognition particle. And this is what targets all of the ribosomes to the endoplasmic reticulum. So when you see the rough ER and you see all those pictures of the ribosomes along the endoplasmic reticulum, these are all ribosomes that were brought there because of this mechanism. Once the, trans once the SRP receptor binds to the signal recognition particle, okay, the, the SRP, the signal recognition particle, is removed okay, and displaced and it can go on and go back to the cytoplasm and find more proteins. And the signal recognition particle receptor then takes this complex of the ribosome and the protein and moves it into what's called a translocation channel. And this is essentially a transmembrane channel in the endoplasmic reticular membrane that now the protein will start to be fed through, like stringing spaghetti through a, a small hole. And that's how you get a protein to go into the endoplasmic reticulum lumen. So what you see here now is the SRP receptor displaces the SRP and helps transfer this ribosome complex to the translocation channel and then in the translocate the ribosome is now bound to this translocation channel and it actually will continue to synthesize the protein and as it's synthesizing it it's pushing it through the translocation channel over time once the protein is done being made it cleaves off this uh, ER signal sequence by a protein called uh, ER signal sequence or signal sequence peptidase and I'll write that down here. So a protein called a peptidase will cleave off that signal. And a peptidase essentially is an enzyme that cleaves peptides. And now you have a fully uh, functioning protein down here that's contained inside the ER that was made through this mechanism. Okay, so signal recognition particle recognizes the ER signal sequence, stops translation, brings the entire complex to the SRP receptor on the plasma membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. The SRP receptor removes the SRP and transfers the whole complex to a translocation channel and translation continues by making the polypeptide through the channel into the lumen of the ER. Okay, and so here's an animation of what I just showed and what you'll see here, this is the mRNA down here. Okay. And these little blue things are tRNAs coming in to bring amino acids to the growing polypeptide chain, which you see here in black. And the growing polypeptide chain is being pushed out the top of the large ribosomal subunit. So slowly up here, what happens is you'll, you'll recognize an SR, or a ER signal sequence is going to be exposed. Here comes the SRP receptor, or I'm sorry, the SRP itself, which binds to the SRP receptor which then transfers this complex to the translocation channel and allows the mRNA to be uh, fed through the translocation channel into the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so the key is that when the SRP signal recognition particle binds to the ER signal sequence and to the ribosome, it stops translation until it can find the SRP receptor on the plasma membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, which transfers it to the translocation channel and then allows translation to continue uh, pushing the mRNA through.
Okay, lastly in this topic we covered uh, very briefly receptor mediated endocytosis. Now remember endocytosis, um, there are several kinds, there's penocytosis and phagocytosis. And then I gave you the example of taking in a cargo protein from the extracellular space through receptor mediated endocytosis. And the key to receptor mediated endocytosis is that this is what we call a clathrin mediated process. All right, and I'll explain what that means. So here you have a receptor on the plasma membrane, and this can be for any protein. The example I gave in class was low density lipoprotein or LDL. And so when a cargo protein binds to the receptor, the receptors will kind of congregate together and cluster, all right? And a vesicle will start to form. So a vesicle forms by several ways. First, a protein called adaptin will bind to the cytoplasmic tail of the receptor right here. So here's the cytoplasmic tail of the receptor, and this is where adaptin binds. So you have a bunch of adaptin molecules bound to the receptor that therefore is bound to the cargo. Then the protein clathrin comes and binds to adaptin. So here's a clathrin molecule. And remember, clathrin makes a protein-like shell around the vesicle, and this helps protect the vesicle while it's being endocytosed, so it doesn't get destroyed. So as clathrin comes in, it's, you can see here, surrounding the entire vesicle, you have adaptin in between, bound to the cytoplasmic tail of the receptor, and then you have the receptor with all the cargo it needs to deliver. In order for the vesicle to actually be taken off from the plasma membrane, a protein called dynamin wraps around this kind of neck of plasma membrane and actually will, will, will cut this part of the plasma membrane in half, which allows the vesicle to be freely uh, dissociated from the plasma membrane. One thing to remember is that dynamin is a GTP binding protein, so it uses the hydrolysis of GTP to provide the energy to actually cut this plasma membrane, like, it's almost like scissors. And so now you have a free vesicle. This is what we call a clathrin-coated vesicle because it's got an outer shell of the clathrin protein, which is, has in between it adaptin that's bound to the cytoplasmic tail of the receptors. And once this protein is cleaved off completely, it, become, it completely disassembles. The clathrin and the adapted molecules will fall off of the vesicle, and now you have what's called an uncoated vesicle that contains only the receptor and the cargo protein and the cytoplasm. Okay, so this is the basic mechanism of receptor-mediated endocytosis, and the key to it is the adaptin clathrin complex that forms to protect the, the vesicle. So once the vesicle is completely uncoated, you need to somehow get the receptor away from the cargo. The cargo protein is something that we want to either degrade or deliver somewhere else in the cell. And the receptor protein is something that we want to recycle. We want to bring this back to the plasma membrane so it can bring in more of the cargo. And so what happens is the vesicle fuses with a, a part of the cell called the endosome. And the endosome is essentially a recycling center. So let's just write recycle here, because that's what it's going to do. Oops, sorry. Recycle. So what the endosome does is it sorts out the receptor on one side, all right, and it leaves the cargo protein inside the endosome. And so the endosome will actually start pinching off little vesicles of receptor, sending it back to the plasma membrane so that this receptor can be reused. The cargo uh, that's left in the endosome after the endosome sorts out the receptor is actually transferred to the lysosome, which is its final de destination. And this cargo typically will get degraded in the lysosome, and the basic building blocks of whatever this cargo was can be reused by the cell. So in this example, we're talking about LDL, and LDL is a way of getting cholesterol into the cell. And so you bring in LDL, and in the lysosome, the free cholesterol is generated here and this free cholesterol can then go be, go be used by the cell for a variety of purposes. So this is the overall mechanism of receptor-mediated endocytosis, and, and I want you to know the basic steps of how the vesicle forms, and then the purpose of the endosome and the lysosome. Okay? So I hope that those, these slides helped you on this topic. Um, again, email me if you have any questions about it.